Yeah, but today we have E.J. Parker, who is a, an artist and a teacher. He said he's been living in St. Louis about six years. Uh, originally from Georgia, has a PhD from Baylor University in religious studies. So he really does a widespread area of the humanities. I think he's probably going to talk mostly about our today's talk is called Art and Myth Making. So please welcome DJ Park. Everyone, um, and thanks for being here. It's great to see you all, and I uh, just appreciate you taking the time um, to spend a lunch hour with me. Um, just like uh, Karen was saying, um, I recently just finished my artist in residence um, here you know, with the Cranesburg Arts Foundation, and uh, this talk is partially um, some of the content that has come out of that. I only put one piece of mine in this, so there, you will see a little bit of my work, but really what I'm trying to do is help us think about the artist's role um, uh, as storyteller and myth maker um, a little bit more broadly. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Um, I grew up in Georgia, uh, and I was born in 1980, so I'm 43. And I remember my dad being someone who could fix anything. Um, you know, if, if it was just like there's a, a hole in the wall that needs to be patched, dad fixes it. If there's a carburetor that needs to be adjusted on one of our cars, dad fixes it. Um, if there's a door that needs to be replaced because the dog scratched it, dad fixes it. And so I grew up sort of thinking that um, that my dad was this like mythological figure who could really do anything. Um, and that was a very formative story for me. I also remember in about fifth grade discovering Greek mythology. And for whatever reason, probably, I, I, I don't know, I discovered um, Hercules and the 12 labors of Hercules. And all of a sudden, uh, maybe I was mixing dad and Hercules a little bit. But I remember how formative it was for me to see um, and, and to think about it, to read these stories of Hercules being able to accomplish really supernatural feats. Um, and yes, okay, he's half God, but he's also half human, so maybe I could do that as well. Um, so that's another example of early on stories being incredibly formative for me. And if I'm honest, I probably took the dad can do anything and Hercules is extremely impressive into my life when I was, I don't know, like playing baseball or making art or um, playing basketball. I sort of probably projected some of those ideas from those myths into my everyday life. I also grew up um, in, a, in a religious context and those stories equally shaped me at a really young age. Um, and so, uh, they, they formed me and sort of built my worldview in a very particular way about um, who has power, who doesn't have power, who's in the in-group, who's not in the in-group, who should be allowed in the in-group, and who should not be allowed in the in-group. Um, and so what I'm getting at is the way in which stories um, come to bear on us are very, very formative. And when I talk about myth, I don't necessarily talk about something that I think of as true or untrue um, historically, as much as I think about a story that is extremely formative for us. And I think it's much more interesting to think about stories that have power in our lives as opposed to stories that have historical veracity. So what I want to do today is talk about um, where myths or stories are um, in our current context, the context that we share. And then also I'm going to turn a corner and talk about um, the role that uh, visual artists play, which I think is especially, uh, especially unique as those um, individuals who can expand the possibility of what stories can do um, in our lives.
to get there, um, we're going to have to do a, just a little bit of groundwork before we start looking at pictures. Okay, so just hang on with me. I promise we'll get to pictures. They will be great. At least I think they're great. Um, but I think in order to talk about myth and our context, we have to first talk about a little bit of a <clears throat> jargonish word um, that's meta narrative. Meta narrative. What in the heck is meta narrative? All right, that sounds like a philosophical term. So let me give you a definition, and then let's just sort of unpack what that is and um, how it works in today's uh, context and, and in our lives. I would say that a meta narrative is um, an overarching story that explains um, and provides meaning to various data points that we experience. Um, another way to talk about it is that it's a worldview that sort of makes sense out of the things that you experience. Okay, that's great, BJ, but can you give me some examples? I'm glad you asked. Yes, I can. Um, so let's just talk about politics for a minute. I'm sure in this room there are a variety of political viewpoints, um, which is great, that's healthy. Um, if you have this idea that, oh, all of politics is run by some cabal of wealthy elites who pull the strings on everything, when you go to apply for a job and you don't get a job, you have a person to blame and you say, oh, it's this person's fault and that's why um, this thing is happening to me. That's, that's a meta narrative. You have a, a big overarching story that provides structure to your daily lived experiences. Notice that the meta narrative, the way I'm describing it, isn't saying whether something is true or not true. It's just how we make meaning out of our experiences. Another example from politics um, could be if, uh, well, actually, if we just zoom out and we think about um, libertarianism or, or fascism or uh, uh, liberal democracy um, or communism. All of these are meta, for different meta narratives that uh, folks can um, subscribe to and make sense out of what their experiences are. If we sort of zoom out and extend out past that and think about um, not just a political viewpoint but a culture, if I do this, what do you think of? Yes. Prayer, peace, someone said. Anything, anything outside of that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Has anyone, has anyone been to Southeast Asia? Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Thailand. I had a chance to teach English in Thailand, and this means something absolutely fundam fundamentally different in Thailand and in Southeast Asia than a precious moments little doll that's praying, right? This is, um, yes, it's a greeting, but it's also uh, a sign of respect and saying, like, I acknowledge who you are as an individual. I acknowledge the life force inside of you. Um, and so even something as small as a hand gesture points to a meta narrative, um, a way of making sense out of all the data points that we experience. If we zoom out even further past that um, from a cultural experience to the largest myths that we can imagine, we might consider that to be um, science. So if you think of quantum mechanics, um, that is a meta narrative, how, how you make sense of what the universe is or how the universe is. To be honest, I'm, this is an aside that's not related to any of this. I'm constantly fascinated by black holes. So if you have any information on black holes, I would love to talk to you about that because I can't quite wrap my head around what's happening there. Um, but that's a, that's a meta narrative, or that's part of a meta narrative as well. We could also think about religious systems as meta narratives. So whatever religious system or non-religious system, a way that you interact with the world to understand who you are, what your purpose is, or what your purpose isn't, and where you're going, and why you're going there. Those are all meta-narratives. Okay, great, we got meta-narratives solved, uh, or at least defined. But here's the thing, is that uh, if we go back to, say, the Enlightenment, and think about the beginning of the scientific method, and sort of keep progressing forward, what we find is the 20th century was exceptionally difficult. So just holler out a little bit, what are some of the major things that you 
uh, remember happening in the 20th century that are like really big developments? War, two wars. Yeah, two war, two world wars. I mean, those are huge. They fundamentally shifted society. What else? The Holocaust. Mm-hmm. The Holocaust um, really fundamentally reshaped how we think about life, how we think about faith, how we think about um, the way in which we relate to other human beings. What else? Radio, television. Yes. Airplanes. Yes. <laughs> the moon landing. Yeah. Birth control. Birth control. Yeah. yeah. Women voting. Women, yeah, like how is it even possible that women got the right to vote in the 20th century? What? Yeah, so what I'm getting at is exponential change happened in the 20th century. It wasn't this like slow build of change. The 20th century was an explosion of changes that happened. So what I want to do is read a poem by W.B. Yeats that gets at um, the way in which the 20th century um, dealt with meta narrative. So I'm going to read out loud. I threw it up there just because I like to read along as well. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loose. And everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best like all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image, uh, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands. Oh man, my copy's messed up. Somewhere in the sands of the... Desert. Desert, thank you. A shape with a blind body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Uh, wow, I think that that Yeats poem is really incredibly powerful. In your view, so Umbrella of Grace, no wrong answers. In your view, what um, what is Yeats, how is Yeats interacting with the idea of one story that explains things? Nobody. Mm-hmm. I'll point us to again umbrella grace no wrong answers um, things fall apart the center cannot hold that's a pretty famous line from this poem um, and then if we go on and we look at the way in which he's interacting with this imagery this Christian imagery um, I, I would say my reading of this poem is that what he's doing is saying that the narratives that have given shape to western Western culture and Western civilization aren't going to hold up, that they're falling apart, and that we have to, like, there's something else that's, that's going to come or something else is going to happen. So I, I brought this poem up because even as early as the very early 20th century, we have a poet who's putting their finger on the pulse of culture and saying, hey, Things are shifting. Things aren't quite like what we thought they were. Um, just because I like poetry a lot, um, I also think of the uh, poet Rilke. If you read Rilke, um, it's an, he's an Austrian poet, um, late 19th, early 20th century. And there's this really deep yearning that you find in his poetry. While he's not as, uh, I would say he's not as forthright with his words as Yeats is in that poem, you do get a sense that there's something that's shifting, there's something that's different. If you fast forward all the way to Mary Oliver, um, mid to late uh, 20th century and even in 21st century, you still see the same thing, that there's this deep yearning for something that's bigger than ourselves, and yet the narratives that 
um, have shaped most of Western society for so long are breaking down and aren't working the same way. And I think that that gets us to the place that I really wanted to start the conversation about the artist role is we have a deep yearning for stories that help us make sense out of things. But we also know that as someone living in the 21st century, if someone approaches us and says, I have the story, we're gonna automatically be skeptical. If someone says, you have to convert to this religion, or you have to live this particular way, we're gonna say, mm, nah, I don't know about that. And so it, it creates this problem of us wanting, um, wanting stories that provide meaning for us, and at the same time, finding that problematic point. So I would say that um, artists, here's, here's sort of the claim that I want to make, and then we're going to get to look at some artwork finally. Artists are makers of metaphors. And as makers of metaphors, artists are also makers of myths or mythology. And as such, artists are uniquely situated to make space for others to find their way into meaning making. So artists make things. And as, um, because they make things, uh, those things become metaphors, and metaphors sort of lend themselves to mythology. And good stories invite people in and help people find meaning. So if I say, man is a wolf, what do you think? Independence, strong, faithful. Yeah. What was the what was the very last thing? Independent, strong, faithful. Is that right? And then I heard someone else say something. Predatory. Predatory. Okay. What else? Yeah. Again, I'm not looking for any. I'm not fishing for answers. So, Just Harry. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's great. Ferocious. Ferocious. Pack light. Pack light. Light. Oh, pack like, gotcha. Yeah, that's great. So here's what I think is interesting about this part of our conversation. Um, what we just did was metaphor, like literally a metaphor is a, a comparison that's not using like or as, which is a simile. So we said man is a wolf. What we did is we took our notions of what a wolf is and placed those on top of a person. We do the same thing when we make art. Um, when artists are making something, we are creating this thing that um, is the recipient of people's projections or they're projecting the ideas in the artwork onto their own lives. And so there's opportunity for meaning making to happen. All right. So finally, some artwork. So this is some of the earliest artwork that humans have made. What do you see? Animals. Yeah, animals. We're just telling stories about, I guess, the importance of animals to our survival. If you've seen Kunk on Earth, which is a really funny Netflix series, um, Kunk the comedian says that we're waging war against the animals. Um, I don't think that's quite what it is, but yeah. Anyone know this? Yeah, exactly. And this really blows my mind. How old is this? Like 30,000 years old. 30,000 years old. So think about, um, same thing with this one, about 30,000 years old. So think, just zoom back in your, in your brain. When did written history start? Who cares? <laughs> uh, it wasn't 30,000 years ago. Like maybe 5,000 years ago, maybe 6,000 years ago. And so when we are starting to write stories down is 6,000 years ago, but zoom way back, 30,000 years ago, and this is an object that tells a story. 
that's important. And you can start to like decipher what was important to humans, what gives us meaning, and why. Zoom forward a little bit, and we're in the Assyrian um, kingdom, which 8900 BCE. And I would say that here we start to see story being used as a a power device. Who has power? Who doesn't have power? What does that power look like? Um, And I put this in, I have to, just as a disclaimer, I know Western civilization pretty well, but I I don't know Eastern civilization and Eastern history very well. Um, So most of the images we're gonna look at are bent towards Western civ. Um, But I think it's also important to think about um, image making and storytelling as a huge part of Chinese culture um, that gives rise to um, the breadth and beauty of storytelling that's happening today. So this is Guardians of the Day and the Night, which is, um, I think this this was 500 BCE. and then we go forward, and we're in Greek sculpture. Anyone know what myth this is telling? Laocoon. Laocoon and Sons. Anyone know more about that myth? I'm a geek who loves, obviously, who loves Hercules, so. So in this story, um, Laocoon tells, uh, I think it's the Spartans, hey, There's about to be a Trojan horse that comes in. Don't take it. And one of the gods gets mad at Laocoon for giving up the secret and um, damns Laocoon and his sons to be eaten by snakes. Yeah, pretty bad way to go. Um, But like, so this is a really beautiful sculpture and at the same time, it's reinforcing a worldview or a meta-narrative or a mythology that says, this is what happens if you don't do what you're supposed to do.
stories in art is, um, and really uh, the way that meaning making happens and what it does for the viewer, is the story of Vulcan and Mars um, and Venus. So let me just sort of give you the down and dirty on the story. Um, Vulcan, or his Greek name is Hephaestus, is married to Venus, and they're, I guess, not so happily ever after because Venus decides that she's going to have an affair with Mars or Ares. And so they're doing their thing, and Mars says, well, Vulcan, you're the god of technology and craftsmanship, so I need you to make me some armor. And so Vulcan says, okay, I'll do that. He's working on the armor, working on the armor. Meanwhile, um, Mars and Venus are having a good time, and Apollo shows up and tells Vulcan what's going on. And so then Vulcan sneaks over with a net that's so finely woven it's invisible and throws it over them while they're in the middle of having sex and then calls all of the gods on Olympus to come laugh at him. And so the image on the left, you can see one painter's version of that. You see the gods on Mount Olympus up in the right corner, and you see um, Hephaestus or Vulcan with the net over the two lovers. The one on the right is a little bit more chaotic, um, but it's essentially sort of the same um, visual retelling of the story. Go forward to Velasquez, and Velasquez, the way in which he tells the story is completely shifts, um, shifts the viewer's viewpoint to the moment that Apollo shows up at Vulcan's forge or Hephaestus' forge to tell him. And so he, he shifts the interest of the story there. Um, through art history, the way that this painting gets interpreted is, which I'm like, man, this is a really big stretch, but Apollo gets interpreted as a Christ figure, um, I guess like delivering hope to humanity, right? And so it's, it's a theophany or an appearance of God. So here's one example. Um, actually, hold, so hold that thought about um, Vulcan at, uh, or Apollo Vulcan's Forge. Another example of meaning making in art is Picasso. Um, I don't, I don't have, I'm too young to have any memories of the Korean War, um, and I don't have any relatives who fought in the Korean War, um, but there are lots of perspectives, right? And this is Picasso's perspective, and what he does is he has all the soldiers who, in, who are involved as dehumanized robots um, who are perpetrating violence, and this has all sorts of references to previous paintings like The Oath of the Horasi by Jacques-Louis David, and... Um, uh, the, yep, yep, I was going to say Goya's uh, 5th of May is that the name of it um, and then Manet's uh, execution of the Emperor Maximilian so we see that happening throughout um, painting so what I was trying to do was build a narrative in art all the way from cave paintings up to really pretty current context right, so here's one piece that was in my show um, from my residency, the one on the right. And what I've tried to do is really more than anything, create um, opportunities for viewers to enter in.
are torn down and 